Hello, my name is Rebecca Marr and in this short talk I'm going to be discussing innovations in North Ronsi that have connected the islanders with seaweed. A little background to my interest in seaweed. I'm a photographic artist and I've been making work using seaweeds for a while now. I became interested in seaweed when I moved to Orkney and I've been inspired by the work of the innovative photographer, the first woman photographer, Anna Atkins. In the early 1840s and within the first decade of photography, Atkins produced the first ever photography book and her subject was seaweed. Each edition was illustrated with direct prints of seaweeds forever trapped in the watery blue of her lovely cyanotypes. I then became interested in the fascinating social history of seaweed in Orkney while I was neighbour to Willie Thompson, who wrote this wonderful book. Hugh Marwick's 1929 book, Orkney Norn, contains many words concerning seaweeds, and this bears out the close association between islanders and this most abundant resource. We're going to look at North Ronsey's particular connection with seaweed, and in this aerial photograph, we can see the Dennis Ness area of the island where the lighthouse and the old beacon reside. There are several stone structures within this photograph that relate to the island's use of seaweed, and we will take a look at those shortly. But first, a quick immersion in the shore. The foreshore is the area between the tides, an area that is sometimes land and sometimes sea. And it is here in this zone that the rockweeds live. Each seaweed has its own particular zone and in Orkney, the seaweeds are brought together under two general titles, tang, the seaweeds that grow below the low water mark and high water mark in the intertidal zone. And tang refers to the racks such as bladder rack, knotted rack and channel rack. And then there is ware, which lives below the low water mark in the sublittoral zone. These are the larger seaweeds such as what are now referred to as the kelps. They include Laminaria digitata and Laminaria hyperborea, known in Orkney as Tangle and Cuvi Tangle. Just to keep you on your toes though, Tangle is a wear and not a tang, and sometimes the term wear refers generally to all seaweeds. So, back to our aerial photograph. In this image you can see small circles by the shore. These are planty crews, circular stone-built structures that were used to raise kale seeds until they were large enough to transplant in the kale yards. These structures were situated by the shore, a frost-free environment, and the structures themselves protected seedlings from the worst of the winds. Robert Rendell, in his poem, writes of the planty crews dressed with wear, wear being seaweed, and finishes the poem with the line, man's old inheritance of sea and soil. So this is our first connection, seaweed used by the islanders as manure to enrich the soil. And it is not only the planty crews that are dressed with wear. The fields too were fertilized with seaweed. And here is Sarah Hooking feeding her field. This resource was so valued that a road, the Ware Road, was built between the shore and the land and it was improved to allow horse and cart to deliver this rich soil improver to the crofts and farms. Now another circular stone structure, too small to be seen in our aerial photograph. This is the kelp kiln. Seaweed fired a boom and bust economy in Orkney in the late 18th and early 19th century. We use the term kelp to refer to the larger seaweeds these days, but then it was the term used for the end product itself. The kelp was a source of alkali and was used in the soap and glass industries during the first kelp boom, as well as in dyeing factories. And that was when rock weeds were used, the ones that grow above the low water mark, and they were used for their high soda content. Later, kelp became used as a source of iodine, and it was then that the larger laminaria seaweeds like the tangles were used 
for their high iodine content. Iodine's popularity as a cure-all had grown rapidly and the Victorian market sustained the kelp industry for quite some time. It was an industry that exploited two resources available to the Orkney Laird, the vast quantities of seaweed and the workforce. Huge returns were enjoyed by the Lairds for very little outlay, but for the kelp workers, the work was harsh and demanding. Carting up seaweed, stacking and drying it, then burning it in the stone-lined pit of the kelp kiln, tending to it for many hours, then leaving it to cool and harden. It was then broken into lumps. This was called raising the kiln. The industry grew in North Ronsey and brought about change with a shift into a cash economy. Families found that they could pay their yearly rent and still have some left over. Population swelled and often two brothers worked the same croft. Ultimately, following the collapse of the industry due to cheaper imports of iodine, the island could not sustain its swelled population. There was resettlement from North Ronsey to the island of Eddy for 32 families in 1851. Now to another seaweed industry. Look at these stone structures here in this Guni Moberg photograph. These are low stone walls or steeths, and they were used in the alginate industry that sprang up in the early 1900s. And here is a steeth loaded with tangles. This industry used the laminaria seaweeds, specifically the stipes of them. Alginate is used in many products. It gives froth to beer, texture to toothpaste and ice cream, among many other things. Storms could drive brooks of tangles ashore, but islanders would have to win them from the shore, saving them from the tide. Here is a recording of Helen Swanee of Treb recalling working in the tangles. I did quite a bit of that work, yes. Uh-huh. Well, in the winter season, when the storms came on and drove them ashore, you had good casts of tangles then. And it usually had the seaweed attached to it, you know. And you had to break that away. Just doubled it and it snapped over. It, was good. But it took a bit of strength to do it, mine. It was tough work, yeah. And cold, because it would be winter. Yeah, very cold, yes. I you need to throw them up, you know. Up above the high water mark, then to save them. Otherwise, then they would have gone again with the next tide. So I throw them and then throw them again. So would you throw them into a pile, a first pile, yeah. and then throw the I second sort pile? Of I sort of and then you had a stone built sort of steeds, as we call them, but bases that you stack them on to dry. They had to be dried, you see, because of weight that took about the uh, Four ton of wet tangle, see one ton of dry tangle. Yes, a high high water content. Yes, and you just shrink, you know, you could see them. You cut a crisscross, you stack them one way. But the hold fast, you know, that they grow that on the seabed. Mm -hmm. You get a sort of round hole, what you call the hold fast. And you stack all the hold fast on one side so long, and then you reverse it. Sort of kept them at a level then, you see. Oh, I see, because there's a bit of height in the whole face. I, I, it was higher on the whole pass side. And then you had to reverse, and, and then that kept them at a level, sort of time about, alternately, you know. And how high would you stack it on the steeth? Oh, you would be, well, it depends on the amount of tangles you had to stack, but you could have them two or three feet, I would think. But they didn't pay to stack too much, so they didn't get a chance to dry so well. So it's better stack a little bit and let it dry out and then stack again, sort of, gradually. Islanders worked in shareholdings and sold off bundles of dried tangle. North Ronsey folk worked the shore in an echo of their kelp-making ancestors. This back-breaking work was no different from the earlier tangle gathering, but by this time, some shareholders had the use of winches made out of back axles and gearing off old vans. Shipments were collected from North Ronsey and taken to a factory in the Western Isles by the Tangle Ferry. 
just as with the kelp industry, eventually cheaper alternatives were found to supply the alginate industry. Up into the 1980s, tangles were collected in North Ronsley and shipped, but latterly the cost of transporting them and the high ratio of wet weed to dried meant few continued to work the tangles. Now cast your mind back to our aerial photograph and let's think about one of North Ronsley's most famous structures, the sheep dike that circles the island and keeps the sheep off the land, but this exclusion of course ultimately protected the breed. The sheep dike, now a listed structure, was built in the 1830s and confined the sheep to the shore, where they famously developed a taste for seaweed, living almost entirely on algae, except for short spells on grass at lambing time. But if you're a North Ronsey sheep, are you discerning in your grazing habits? It turns out the sheep do have a menu of seaweeds. In a paper titled The Digestibility of Seaweed in Orkney Sheep by Greenwood, Orpin and Patterson, certain seaweeds were identified as the favourite of North Ronsley's shore dwellers. And here they are in order of preference. Dulse. Once known in Orkney as sow sorrel, sheep's dulse, a favourite too with human seaweed eaters. Dabberlocks, known by various Orkney names including honeyware, and its Latin name, Alaria esculenta, meaning winged tasty, which bears out its high food value. Tango, known in Japan as kombu, and a source of contentment for those looking to satisfy the fifth taste, umami. And knotted rag. I use this in the bathroom and the dark room rather than the kitchen. It is my favorite seaweed aesthetically, and it's great for an invigorating soak. And it's also good for the land. And bladder rack. Bertie Thompson of Peco knew more than most about the North Ronsley sheep and their seaweed habits. He also identified dulse as their top choice. Let's listen to this recording of Bertie talking about dulse. Well, it's uh, the dulse, I mean, the dulse doesn't come ashore unless it's uh, quite a bit of sea on. Oh, there's no doubt about it. It's, it's just obvious. Once you get a, a fresh bag of wear with it, uh, and the stem of the thing is just actually leathered. It's actually very bonny. The whole stem is covered with this. Uh, it's like a, a wine colour and uh, leafy little stuff. And very, very, it looks very digestible. And it's, it's just go for that right away. And nothing they like, love it like that. The cloak of the tiger, of course, I mean, it, it's, a, it's their main feet. The, the dulse does it, it's not there all the time. It only comes uh, from time to time with, it, with, the, with the heavier seas. It's evident once that type of seaweed came ashore in winter, you know, the condition of your sheep uh, improved dramatically. The best grass inland, it was equal to the best grass in, inland. Dulse is an epiphyte, which means it grows on another plant, not as a parasite, but using it for support. Dulse grows on Laminaria hyperborea, known in Orkney as cuvie tangle, and it is the rough stipe of the cuvie that allows it to attach, unlike the smooth stipe of the tangle. Seaweed is such a rich subject, and this has been a short talk focusing on the innovative and creative uses of seaweed that the islanders have utilised as fertiliser, a food for the land, as food for the sheep, fodder, and in the two industries of kelp and alginate. But let's leave with the thought of the epiphytic relationship where one thing offers support, something to hold fast to for another. And then think of the islanders and their connected tangled history with seaweed. Thank you.